Hello everyone, Dr. Christine Smith here with a really awesome guest for you today, Dr. Aruna Tumala, who is a holistic psychiatrist. And that, if you're familiar with the field of psychiatry, like finding a holistic psychiatrist who's also an MD, she thinks about mental health. I think it is something that is really needed in our field and she approaches it from a bunch of different ways and she is certified in integrated and holistic medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, which is one of the oldest forms of medicine out there. And she recently got a certification in hyperbaric therapy. I was just checking out. So hello, Dr. Tamala, how are you? Hi, Christine, how are you? And please call me Aruna. All right, you got it. I'm good. I'm so glad to have you here. It's good to see you. Likewise, likewise, and we've vibed. Uh, I've been uh, so looking forward to doing this with you. We've talked about it for quite some time. I know, me too. So this is, I'm, I'm actually quite excited for this one. I think this is a really important topic for people and I think it's incredibly misunderstood in healthcare. So I was just introducing you a little bit, but why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and then we can kind of talk a little bit about the holistic model of mental health and psychiatry. Thank you, Christine. But I, th I think you hit the main point. So I'm both certified in adult and geriatric psychiatry. Um, I think the big difference that I bring uh, to the table is the fact that I grew up in a different uh, culture, in a different country, and India being one of the uh, older cultures around in this world. Um, my And I come from a smaller town, so I didn't really grow up in a big city. I think that also plays a role to it. So my life was so much more in tune with the natural naturalness of life. I don't know how else to put it. I mean, you know, the, I uh, to, just to give an example, I think I started using shampoo only after moving to the U.S. at the age of 26 or 27. Before that, it was soap nut powder for the most part, unless I was traveling. Then I would buy these little, you know, this is what we did, really. Um, so it, it was natural to that extent, but, you know, the convenience of the modern life with the soaps and, I mean, with everything, everything, in fact, convenience foods and everything, it was so easy to get sucked into it. Uh, but, um, yeah, so, uh, and even my training in India in medicine and, and psychiatry was a, more holistic than it is here in the U.S. And that was one of the big contrasts I saw because I had to repeat my residency here in the U.S. as well. And uh, and I all share this story because this 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 is a real life experience that I had, and it really exemplifies how disconnected we have become and how divorced our minds and bodies have become. And this is the story. So in India, if I did not do a proper physical exam and a neuro exam for a psychiatric patient, my evaluation was considered incomplete. This is I'm talking about in my psychiatric residency. But on my very first day here, everybody knew I was a practicing psychiatrist from India. So the attending said, hey, why don't you demonstrate it to the brand new resident and, and medical student? So I did the interview part, which was talking to the patient. And then I stood up to examine the patient. And the attending was flabbergasted. He was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm examining the patient. Oh, you can't touch the patient. Why not? We are medical doctors. No, that's uh, no. We don't do that in psychiatry. Then how are you going to rule out medical causes for psychiatric presentation? We have an internist for that. It's uh, this is uh, medical legal liability. You cannot touch the patient. So, and that was it for the next four years. I and that's what that's what happened. But, but I I mean I didn't you know there were so many things I was learning. I was in a new country, adapting to a new culture, to a new system. And I just wanted my degree to be able to practice, right? Um, but uh, simultaneously in my own personal life, what was happening is I was diagnosed with PCOS. I was struggling with infertility um, and uh, started the fertility treatments at that point in time. Then I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. And I was also developing symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. So, and I was not even 30 years old. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> But thankful, thankful for all these health experiences that I've had. Uh, back at that time, I went down the mainstream path. And uh, of course, on the one hand, I was like, I was feeling miserable that now I have to take these medications for the rest of my life. My mom had a similar journey to me. Um, and it seemed like 
her illnesses started a little later on in life for her, but everything was fast forward, forwarding for me. So it, it really was a very hopelessness situation that I was finding myself in. Oh, and then of course, in between my two kids after my first pregnancy, I couldn't handle the, from a cognitive aspect. So I got diagnosed with attention deficit disorder as well. And I tried stimulants for one week and I had such bad insomnia, I couldn't do it anymore. And it was from all of this angst and you know how the universe responds when you know, I didn't even know I was asking these questions, but I began to, uh, again, during my pregnancies and the postpartum period, uh, my uh, in-laws and my parents, they brought in with so many herbs. None of them FDA approved or tested, <laughs> but I had no question about it. Like throughout, like, you know, I remember, uh, I delivered the first time Shatavari was given to me mixed in milk because that would keep up your uh, breast milk production. My whole diet was different. It was rich in garlic and uh, fish and a lot of green leafy vegetables, fenugreek and lamb and to keep up with the breast milk production. I, I, I wasn't allowed to eat potatoes and eggplants in that first 30, 40 days. So I, I did not question any of this, but I, I knew that I had not learned about any of this. And there were so many herbs that I would consume. One was my, one I remember, it's called, uh, these are all Ayurvedic herbs, it's called uh, Vacha. And they, uh, what my mother-in-law said is that it, it'll really help your baby to develop language early, or, or rather, it'll help with language development in the child. And that's what I did. Did not question, okay, where is the evidence for this? And who's, no, thankfully I did not. But uh, then uh, in that same experience, I was taught how to eat for the pregnancy and how to eat for the, deli for the baby. So I used to have so much of clarified butter because again, I was told it's not gonna, you know, it's, it's pure fat I was consuming. But uh, at one point in time, I think it was my mother-in-law, she pointed out like I used to pump my milk. Like if I did not eat enough clarified butter, the milk would be very watery. And she said, this is what nurtures the brains of uh, the developing brain. They need fat, they need clarified butter. You gotta eat more clarified butter. I wasn't complaining, but you know, it was, so these were the experiences then. And, and I began to question, okay, if I'm doing so much, and so much of it was about language development, brain development. It was all centered around that. And I began to question, what are we doing? What am I doing as a psychiatrist for my patients? And so that was when I began to actually Google diet and mental health, nutrition and mental health. And uh, 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 that took me down the rabbit hole. I came across integrative and holistic medicine organizations and uh, came across, uh, you know, uh, naturopathic physicians, chiropractic physicians. I had, you know, all of these terms I had heard, but did not have any idea about uh, the philosophy of medicine and uh, what, what, why, why are all these different disciplines existing? What do you bring to the table? And uh, so it was, I mean, between 2013 and 2016, it was, uh, I dove deep into all of this. And I became uh, interested in functional medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, partly from because of my own experience with that. And uh, I decided to uh, incorporate these two practices in my clinical pra practice. And um, I was actually working for a hospital at that time. Uh, I remember that I came back from uh, a functional medicine conference, I believe in 2015, and I was really gung-ho. I barely lasted six months after that. <laughs> in the hospital. Uh, so, I mean, uh, what I was saying was considered very radical. So, and, uh, but I, I, uh, I really believed and, and, you know, the side story to this is as I was learning all these things, I was able to put my Hashimoto's, my rheumatoid arthritis, my PCOS and my ADD into remission. So, I mean, and I, it's not like I had a mild case. My PCOS was so bad. I would literally uh, have a, a period bleed and it used to be a withdrawal bleed only two times in a year. Four to five months, I would have amenorrhea, uh, anovulatory cycles, and then I would bleed for three weeks continuously. That was a pattern from about age 16 till I want to say age 35. I mean, excluding the pregnancies. And then... One year of you know doing the diet and taking some supplements and and doing the cleanse, um, everything became normal.
it was i mean it was very fantastic actually to see the transformation i think that fueled my you know my purpose and my passion even more like if it it's so so easy to reverse these things for myself why not offer it to everybody else and and really that's how my practice came into existence and and what i discovered is that the way to treat mental illness is is really healing the whole body you have to do that of course you know depression anxiety they have the psychological component there is the mind component there is a spirituality component to it but it has to start by healing the body so sorry wow. i really wanted to that... quickly <laughs> That. No, that, that was amazing. Like, thank you so much for sharing that. And I also just because I want to make sure that we don't lose you. Just so you know, wherever you walked, the service or Wi-Fi is just a little bit on the low side. Oh, so, um, oh, okay. we just want—I just want to make sure to not lose the connection. But yeah, that was an amazing story. And I think you actually just told the story of a lot of different people and a lot of different scenarios. Because the first thing you talked about, right, is you moved to a new country and you. were interpreting a whole new culture and you were doing something really courageous and you were going back to school which is like frustrating after you've gotten your degree and then it's an entirely different schooling system so yeah. that means that you're also double educated um but that i talk to people all the time about the concept of allostatic load like our bodies only have so much capacity for stress and allostatic load is the accumulated amount of stress that our body can handle yeah. from the concept of mental stress physical stress, chemical stress. And with that, I mean, it's not surprising that you had some autoimmune stuff kind of turn up because that's usually the recipe for it is a um high burden of stress with some biological or biochemical disrupts that have been going on previously. And then what a concept that you applied all of these functional medicine, ayurvedic, really old traditional concepts and then all of your conditions kind of started to go away at once rather than addressing things one by one symptomatically yeah. which i think is always more effective and then pregnancy is always an interesting thing because it turns over all your hormones it turns over your immune system mm -hmm. it's a big stressor on your body to grow another human and it is very nutritionally depleting which is why it's so important to do exactly what you were saying and make sure that you're getting all the right nutrition to mm -hmm. not only help grow the new little being inside of you but maintain yourself yeah. in the process yeah. and i think yeah. postpartum is one of the things that it's really hard for women because they just they have this entire care team and then they have their baby and then their care team vanishes and it's when they're in their most nutritionally deficient state yeah. so i think talking about this stuff is really important so um, oh, my god yes absolutely especially the postpartum period christine what i you know i had so much help and i i mean i feel almost guilty to even share that uh because and and this is again part of the culture like in india for the first 4 to 5 weeks the new mom is not even allowed to touch cold water wow because again you know it's it comes from the concept of energy and the idea is that when you are uh creating a new being and birthing a new life all of your energies open up so you are more susceptible to the to the effect of the energy around you so uh a young and a a new postpartum mom is only uh given warm water to drink and she's only allowed to touch warm water uh, or hot water you know um, that's that's how it is and and actually in rural india new moms get massages pretty much every single day for the first month Well, I love that concept. What a great <laughs> yes. concept. So, and I mean, this is all just fantastic. And I'm I'm really excited for this talk. So, I just because the sound and the image is a little bit blurry, you know, is there any chance you can just walk closer to your internet service? Yeah, you know, let me do that. I thought I was on you know, I thought on the phone it should not be. You know, let me find a better spot. Thank you. No, cuz I'm I'm loving the talk already and I want to make sure people get every single piece of yeah. it. Um, yeah. Um, so I know that we had talked a little bit about like the holistic model in general that it's like you have to address trauma that's physical and yes. mental because I think in mental health we only think of trauma as mental which is a huge piece of it 
because it actually has a physical effect on your body, yeah. mental yeah. trauma actually affects your body much like an injury does on a biochemical cascade. But if you get injured, like if you break a bone or you hurt your shoulder or something like that, it can actually also really affect your mental health. And I think that's something that goes unknown. And then there is the component that when you get injured or things like that, it also affects your gut health. And gut health is a huge part of mental health, which I can't wait to dive into you with you because I know you do a lot of this stuff around nutrition, like we were talking about. And then we'll dive into yes, yeah. toxins and understanding even things like the effect of certain medications which I'd be super interested to hear an MD's thoughts on. So what, um, I guess maybe let's talk a little bit about, well, let's start with trauma and then we'll go to nutrition and toxins. Okay, sounds good. Um, trauma, the way I think of it is that, as, as you mentioned, you know, whether it's physical or mental trauma, it affects, the way to think about it is the gut-brain axis. You know, that's the central foundational pillar in our body. And uh, it, any kind of trauma affects the whole gut-brain axis. No question about that. And so in treatment, we really have to, the way I approach every patient is really look at these root causes. And it's exactly those three. It's uh, the food we are eating, the trauma that a person has experienced in their life, and the toxins they're exposed to. These three root causes, I look at literally every system in the body. Neuropsychiatric, skin, gastrointestinal immune system, and uh, for us women especially, but even men too, hormonal uh, health um, and genetics. So I really look at all of these systems to figure out which system uh, is getting affected. And invariably it is at least two or three of these systems are affected. So I typically find gastrointestinal system, neuropsychiatric system, and uh, the hormonal uh, immune system. Yeah. So these are the three or four systems that are commonly affected. For some, it can be the detoxification system. It can be the mitochondrial system. That, that's when we see chronic fatigue and those, you know, the uh, um, uh, myalgia syndromes that in, implicates more the mitochondrial functioning. But again, yeah, but the mitochondrial function is also related to toxin exposure. So as you can see, no matter how you see, you become back to these three root causes what we are eating, what trauma we have experienced, and what toxins we are exposed to. And it really is a matter of figuring out what organ systems in our bodies are bearing the brunt of it and how we can bring those organ systems and then the entire mind, body, spirit system into balance. But with regard to trauma, one other thing that especially, and again, this applies to both physical and psychological trauma. What happens is that there is... The the, the psychological effects of all trauma, like even if you were in a car accident and it wasn't your, you didn't have a head injury, but you had, you broke your leg. The fear that sets in because of that, it puts us in a sympathetic arousal. And if you've experienced um, emotional trauma, that puts you in the sympathetic arousal. And sympathetic arousal is a high energy dependent state. Even if you're not being chased by a tiger, uh, it is still a high energy dependent state. And, and it's what a happens state, the breakdown state. It is and, and the reason for that breakdown is because anabolism is not happening. Because anabolism is also a high energy dependent state. And for because sympathetic arousal is linked to our survival. So our mind-body uh, system, because it's quite intelligent, it is rightfully prioritizing survival over anabolism which is repair and regeneration. And no matter how old you are uh, or what disease you present with, paying a, a ten, uh, at addressing this sympathetic arousal and the survival state is very, very important. And I'll share a patient example. So I'm working with a 73-year-old man who came in with, he self-diagnosed himself as having COVID brain. And as part of the evaluation, really what I found is that uh, he did have a COVID infection and that exacerbated his neurological problems. Uh, but prior to that, he was already developing symptoms of actually neurodegenerative. He's had TIAs and, you know, those kinds of things and balance issues. He was, he's high functioning, but those balance issues and a couple of falls indicate that things were already happening even before COVID set in. And five years ago, he had a gut dysbiosis that was diagnosed and he was treated for that. So as you can see, all of these things were happening, and this is just an aside, but I do want to tell 
uh, our listeners today that whenever we see long haul, it's not about the virus. It's about how you were before the virus attacked you. It, that's very, very important, right? And I know we are in agreement about that. But in this gentleman, he's 73 years old. On the first day when I, in my intake appointment, the moment I started to explore his childhood, um, and he has had a very traumatic relationship with his uh, uh, long passed away mother. Uh, she, was, she was very abusive towards him. He started crying, but then also denying that there is no trauma. It has nothing to do with, I came here for my COVID brain. It has nothing to do with trauma, was what he was. But it took me a couple, and his wife, a very, very supportive, loving wife, and she's like, no, you got to listen to what she's saying. You've got to let go of your guilt. You've got to let go. Of, this is what's impacting you. And I had to explain to him exactly that. As long as he's feeling those, you know, you know because he had a traumatic relationship, he, he had negative feelings towards his mother. And when she died, he internalized that guilt and blamed himself for her death. He had nothing to do with it, but blamed himself for it. Intellectually, he recognizes that that's not the case. But emotionally, he still blames himself, even after, what, 50 years of her passing away. And that is impacting, may not be directly causing his neurodegenerative condition and the strokes, but it is preventing him from the anabolic process, which is about repair and regeneration. So I think he got the message finally that we need to put that trauma to rest. So, yeah, so uh, I, I do want people to understand that we have to get to a place of safety, nervous system safety, which has to translate into self-love and self-worth. Well, and there's this interesting concept around emotions too, where it's like emotions are chemistry. They are peptides in your body and emotions that get kind of suppressed and aren't felt can kind of build up in the system chemically and prevent your cellular processes from working correctly. So there's this balance between focusing on the future and not like wallowing in uh, negative cycle, but also making sure to actually feel your emotions before you move forward. So I think what you're talking about is incredibly important. And if anyone's interested, there's a really cool book on that called The Molecules of Emotion by Candace Pert. And um, I just, it's yeah. it's a really important concept. And if anyone's looking for a great book around that, that, I love the book Letting Go by David Hawkins. And it's all about kind of learning how to work through emotions and let them go. But working with someone like Dr. Tamala, like that's amazing. You need support in that yeah. sometimes, oftentimes actually, just having like a third party to help you evaluate what's going on and realizing that stuff like viruses and infections, like yes, they are a problem that needs to be taken care of, but at the same time, it's usually just gasoline on whatever fire was going on in your body before, and it just emphasizes the issue that was already there. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I can share a little mnemonic or a, a, a cheat code for handling these emotional states. I, I call it face it, feel it, and then you free it. So number one is that you have to be present, no suppressing. And of course, you know, if your situation and where you are allows you to do it, you, you stop everything when those emotions, when you recognize that those, you face them. And then you feel them, not just, and it's not intellectual at all. That's the thing, you know, when people go into that over-intellectualizing, analyzing, I should have done that or I should have said this, and that's not what I'm talking about. It's about feeling it in your body. With, with your soma, it's a, it's a very somatic process. And, and only when you do that, you will actually feel that energy of that emotion actually move, and that's how you'll be able to feel it. And during this process, yes, if you have a, a practice of meditation or breathing and going into alignment with yourself, that will definitely help. Speed up this thing, what I'm talking about, face it, feel it, and then you free it. So that's, um, uh, that can be helpful. Uh I could not agree more. And, you know, I, before we move into the next section, because I'm loving this talk and it's really important and I want people to get every piece of it. For some reason, our connection is still weird. Oh. If I just keep the live going and you uh, cancel out of it and just rejoin and I think it'll reestablish your connection because it's okay. just been a little fuzzy. Thank okay. you. Okay. Let me, yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. Yeah, I'll be right here. So for everyone, just the stuff that she's talking about is incredibly important. And I just, I really hope that some of this is landing and helping people understand that 
it's so much like holistic health is just so important and it's so much more than just addressing the mental side of things like you have to address the physical side of things as well and you have to consider health and you have to consider uh, gut health and nutrition and also like the toxins in your environment and yes this is such a better connection thank you so much for doing that because what you're saying is so important so um any other thoughts around just kind of the realm of trauma in general and physical or mental I think it's it's ubiquitous. I think um, it's uh, you know it's amazing that you know I see primarily patients with psychiatric presentations, but you see people, and I know your speciality is in sports medicine, if I remember that correctly. Um, yeah. So I, right. I do. I basically say I specialize in hidden injuries because hidden injuries. I yeah in the holistic injury recovery because I went through my own process of being injured and then having all my biochemistry off and then having weird autoimmune symptoms and then having a toxin exposure. There's this funny thing we talk about in healthcare, right? Of like the rite of passage as a practitioner where you kind of have yes. to go through your own journey to, you have to, to do it, yeah. properly empathize with your patients. And it's just kind of a part of the process oftentimes. And I find it can make really effective practitioners when, oh, because you never learn totally. more when you're going through it in your own body. But the reason I say hidden, hidden injuries is because People forget that their gut can get injured and their brain can get injured and your thyroid can get injured. And so it allows me to speak to people in a way that they understand because I'll, especially as a chiropractor and you know, chiropractors practice differently in different states and different countries. And luckily in Colorado, um, one of the reasons I chose chiropractic is because it gave me the broadest range of things that I can do without having my hands tied by large corporations. And also the way that chiropractic looks at health is the vitalistic model. And they look at, let me bring out everything that is right with you instead of mm -hmm. let me point out everything that is wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a much different approach to health and it was much more in line with me. And chiropractic is about making sure your nervous system is functioning correctly and that your brain and body are communicating and that your life force is flowing. That's really oh, what chiropractic yes. is about. And so that goes beautifully with functional medicine. And I was kind of raised in a functional medicine office. And I, I thought that's what chiropractic was before I went to school. And then when you go to school, you realize that it's just, it's a skeleton. Like every single degree that you're getting is a skeleton exactly. that gives you a basic foundation. And then it's yes. your responsibility as a practitioner to further educate yourself to blossom into whatever you're doing. So all the stuff that we're talking about, functional medicine, this is not really taught in any of our schools. And yeah, absolutely. Um, yep, and even in chiropractic, I chose it because we get more nutritional education than the medical system. And our nutritional education was still quite sparse. So I have done a ton of nutritional education outside of that. Um, but the hidden injury thing, I think it's really important because people will come in with a shoulder injury or a back injury. And I also need to talk to them about why they're getting injured and why they're getting re-injured and why their ligaments are a little bit weak because they're inflamed, because they've been stressed, because they've been eating the standard American diet. And then my history form is quite long. So someone will come in for a back injury, but then I'll see all this stuff about like toxin exposure, yes. they can't sleep, or wake yeah. up in the middle of the night, and then it dives into this whole other conversation that we're having right now. Exactly. No, I mean, what I was, with regard to trauma, uh, I'm very, very um, impressed and, you know, I don't expect any less from you, um, that you have this comprehensive approach where you're looking at, you're treating sports injuries and the hidden injuries, but you pay attention to trauma, not just physical trauma, but also emotional trauma. And I think, uh, whether it's a medical student or a chiropractic student, they need to be taught about that. Nutrition, yes, but also paying attention to trauma because it's life itself can be traumatic. Well, or rather, I, know, I, I used to say that, but now I say it's not that life is traumatic. Life just throws us curveballs. But if we, the way we respond to it makes it either a trauma response or it makes it a growth response growth and evolution. Oh, 100%. So, if you perceive something as a challenge, it actually helps you grow and it is quite healthy for your system. If you perceive it as a threat, then that is how you can develop things like PTSD, which is why one person can develop PTSD in one situation. And in the same situation, a different person does not develop PTSD. Yeah. But a super interesting 
thing about the neurological community is they're now classifying PTSD as a brain injury. And if it's a brain injury, that means that it's also going to affect your gut. So let's mm -hmm. dive a little bit into nutrition now. How do you like to approach nutrition with your patients and in, in your evaluations? So number one, you know, I actually get them to fill out their uh, uh, diet journal because I, I need to know where they are, what they're eating. That's part of my foundational uh, evaluation. And uh, from there, uh, you know, then with this one of the scales that I use, which basically marks, uh, gets the patients to uh, identify symptoms anywhere in their body and give it a rating. And invariably, we see that something in the GI system is not working well. And, and so in, uh, and the way that I have understood both from Ayurveda and functional medicine is that everything has to be processed by the gastrointestinal lining, whether it is emotional or physiological, it gets processed over there. And, uh, and so, you know, I wanted to refer to the medications as well, you know, as a psychiatrist, these psychiatric medications, they can cause damage to the gut lining and they many I've, I've, I've seen at least um, one article which looked at olanzapine and uh, certain antidepressants this was actually in a patient population struggling with eating disorders and what they found is that these classes of medications they interfere with the microbiome as well they this regulate the microbiome, which we know affects our mood, affects our metabolism, which is why we do see weight gain on uh, with many, many uh, psychiatric medications. And then, of course, uh, when we are manipulating the neurotransmitter levels, which, by the way, there is no chemical imbalance, and most of serotonin, 90% of serotonin is actually made in the gut. And that is where it gets affected. Um, so with regard to my approach, gut health is absolutely critical. That's literally one of the first things that uh, I talk about with my patients because um, it's the gut is like the engine of the car. And this is where the gut has the ability to sift through what should be going into the real us, which is the cells and the blood and the tissues, and what should be kept in the intestinal cavity itself to be excreted later on. The sifting uh, and the sorting process gets uh, affected with inflammation, with toxicity, with trauma, uh, with infections. Um, and even and the other thing that happens with um, microbiome disturbances is that, yes, you may not have a frank infection, but just the overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria will increase the release of a toxin called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which gets, which actually studies have shown that it travels up the vagus nerve into your brain. So when you have a leaky gut, you have a leaky brain. And now I'm also hearing about leaky liver as well, because where instead of just detoxing it and putting it into the bloodstream, it can actually go into the intestine and from the intestine back into the liver again. So, it, and then from the liver into the blood and then going to the heart, to the brain everywhere. So I think the point I'm making here is that we really have to understand that no disease affects only one organ. It's, it's everywhere. And we really have to pay attention to how each individual organ system is functioning in relation to everything else. And we are, our organs don't live in silos. Yes, if you go to a general medical hospital, everybody's in their own little silo. Right. And I st and I'm, I'm guilty of that. So I'm not blaming anyone. I really believe that when you know better, you do better. And most of this criticism comes from the way I was practicing before. And I can blame anybody else. But I know that until I had my own awakening, I didn't even bother to question many of the things that were happening. So um, so it's not about a blame game, but really the everything is in, in us in, is siloed in modern medicine. But our body is not made up of silos. Our bo body is actually a web of interconnections. And that is that is what um, I, I, I tend to digress a little bit. But going back to the gastrointestinal system, that is the first level of intervention in my practice. And when it comes to the diet, I do recommend an elimination diet, which is guided by what I find in the in my clinical interview. But um, uh, that becomes the first step because I, everybody's got leaky gut, which is intestinal permeability, and everybody's got food sensitivities. That is the first thing that we have to address. And then whatever else we find, uh, we then, you know, I then work on addressing those as well. Beautiful. 
people. So, and, you know, in our society, it's pretty hard to not have some leakiness in your gut with the amount of toxins that we're exposed to. And like these days, it's just different than, you know, the days of our grandparents. Like we just are exposed to a ridiculous amount of toxins that we can't control. And that increases the burden within that allostatic load that I talked about. So if your yes. toxin load is higher, your ability to eat poor food is lower. And if you're super stressed out, then it's even lower. So the, I talk to people about like finding this balance, right? If you have a super stressful week at work, you're probably not going to be able to handle alcohol as well. If you're drinking a lot of alcohol, you're probably not going to be as emotionally resilient. And just like understanding these concepts and understanding that it affects every system. And I'm so glad that you said that because our conventional system is just siloed, like you said. And it's like, our organs don't work like that. Our body just does not yeah. work like that. They are all intertwined. So if you have organ dysfunction in one organ, it's probably affecting some of your other organs. And therefore, if we can work on balancing the whole system, which is the whole idea behind holistic and functional medicine, that is why in the beginning when she was talking about how all of her conditions just kind of vanished at the same time when she was working on this holistic system, that's why is because they are all interrelated. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I love what we're talking about here. And when it's, when it comes to food sensitivities, there's, I know like we were actually talking about this earlier, yes. like there's mixed approaches to it. So I love what she does where it's like, if you come in, like you're just going to be doing an elimination diet yeah. period, like just assume that. I would love to assume that for every patient. I cannot tell you the battles that I get with people around gluten, dairy, coffee, when people have adrenal fatigue. And like, like, no, I'm definitely not sensitive to dairy. I'm like, okay, well, let's run a food sensitivity test. We'll just see. Yeah. And some people are, some people aren't, but there's different kinds of your immune system. So some people are like, no, I had the, I had the prick test. I had the poke test. So I wasn't sensitive to that. It's a totally different part of your immune system. That's an IgE pathway. That's like needing to know if you need an EpiPen. I don't really run those because I figure if you need an EpiPen, you probably already know that. So I like to run, if I do run it, like IgG and complement factor. I think complement factor is one of the things practitioners miss a lot. And that one is related to brain inflammation. And there's a really cool book called um, The Angel and the Assassin. And it is all about how complement factor and glial cells work in the brain. And they're kind of like the janitors of the brain and they help reorganize your neurons and stuff. If you get inflamed in your brain and you're producing too much complement factor, say from a weird food that you're eating because you had leaky gut because you just went through a divorce and it was super stressful, then all of a sudden you actually tag your neurons for deletion with complement yes. factor and you can start to get neurodegeneration, which is why understanding this stuff and working on your diet and understanding food is so important. And a lot of the times you can, like if you develop an immune response to something, the way our immune system works, you're just going to have a bit of a memory to that thing for the rest of your life, but you can decrease the response to it. So if you cut that food out for anywhere from like six months to a year, you can probably start having it again, just yes. maybe yeah. not like every single day all the time. And yes. it's about finding balance in your diet and approaching things that way and making sure to feed your microbiome. And when it comes to probiotics, I love probiotic, but I think one of the misunderstood things is that they're the answer to everything. And if you are super inflamed and you start taking probiotics and it is upsetting your system, it might mean that you're not ready for probiotics yet. And we have to work on your gut lining first. And then you can bring in probiotics because they're actually inflammatory, <laughs> even if it's in a positive way, but they work by kicking out other bacteria. So there's a little battle that goes on when you take them. So, and yes. you have to find the type that's right for you, which is where lab testing and gut testing comes in. And I think the gut testing is also really important because when you start to see weird inflammatory markers, and I know like you like to look for infections, it can let you know if you might be dealing with some kind of weird infection, whether that's mold or Lyme or things like that. Yes. So uh, yeah, what are your thoughts around that? So the way, like I said, you know, I present the hypothesis that any time, uh, and this comes from both functional medicine and Ayurveda, any time we are experiencing symptoms of any disease, literally, um, we have leaky gut. And uh, and then, of course, patients are all, you know, when they do some of the assessments, it's a very in-depth assessment. Now, one of the big reasons why I think people don't want to make changes to, to their uh, diet or lifestyle is because of the disconnection with themselves. Like you eat something and you actually feel bad, but when you're not paying attention, you don't even know that you're feeling bad. So that the disconnection with oneself makes you do the things that are harmful for you. Because intentionally, if you really knew, I mean, whether it is 
you know, drinking alcohol or doing uh, drugs. These are all phases of disconnection. And even in relationships, you know, saying hurtful things to another person that you actually love and care for deeply can only happen when you are disconnected from your own self. So everything that we are talking about has a physiological uh, base, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It has uh, meaning for the physiological realm as well as for the psychological realm, right? So, um, so I do present these as immutable facts. <laughs> and I think having gone down this path for myself, I think um, I, I do use humor a lot. And I, you know, kind of show that I know what excuses I've come up with. I know what excuses you're going to come up with. And it is really, so motivation enhancement. I mean, how uh, sick are you? How, how much are you willing to put up with, with what you're going through? And I invite everyone to develop that self-awareness and connection to themselves. And I will tell you, even teenagers, I can get them to give up. And it's not, my, the diet is not forever. It literally is, is temporary with an invitation to test it out, to become uh, an observer, participant observer in this process. It's a science test that you're doing for yourself. So I had a young 14-year-old uh, come in with, uh, you know, she had depression and anxiety and uh, the usual things and uh, also very severe acne. So I said, do this for four to six weeks. And then if your acne, if you don't see any change in your acne, please, you don't have to see me again. And I am confident in saying that because we know what happens. You heal the gut lining, you bring the inflammation down, skin's going to get clear, anxiety got went down but, but for a 14 year old acne was more important even though she was still struggling with anxiety but you know you sometimes you have to kind of you know figure out the pain point at least um, you know in and i think at least locally here in wisconsin people may know of my reputation a little bit i don't know if that is contributing to that but um, and also um, in fact i start off with the ayurvedic uh, herbs actually because they begin the process of uh, detoxification and restoring the digestive fire. <clears throat> and it makes it easy for people to, uh, the cravings go down actually. And, and I think it's, uh, I, and again, I've not, uh, I don't think I've seen any studies on this, but this is my hypothesis that when we are toxic, we have more homocysteine floating in our system, in our blood. And homocysteine makes us crave cigarettes and alcohol and by extension i think junk food as well which then again begets more homocysteine so like begets like i, I see that so then when we start up with some of these herbs and supplements to detox even a little bit um, it's almost another thing i tell everyone is to um, scrape their tongue and if possible do oil pulling because it's the taste sensation right the taste is another indicator that alerts us as to what we should be doing, or what we should be putting in our uh, in our mouths, literally. So with yeah, it, and so that connection with oneself and self awareness is is a very very critical component that I emphasize. Gotcha. I love talking to you. I could not agree with that more. Um, so you, I think okay. There's a couple things I want to comment on that you said. That I just think is great. So. With the self-awareness, I think that is one of the things that I start to teach clients most about. It's just like how to watch your own body and how to understand mm -hmm. symptoms. And half the time, like I ended up developing an online course that people can do on their own at home because sometimes if they do that, they don't even need to come in. And yes. I, and you know, it's simple things. Like if you wake up in the morning and you have a bunch of puffiness around your eyes, you might want to review what you consumed in the last 24 to 48 hours, sometimes 72 hours took as a teenager, took me years to figure out that sugar creates depression for me three days later, it takes 72 hours for it to hit. And so it's just something that I know about myself now, but it took me a really long time to learn that and understand it. And you also commented on like the mental gymnastics that we can do to allow ourselves to do things that we have told ourselves that we don't want to do. And there's this process of becoming aware and it can start with like, you just start watching yourself do these things and you just notice you're still doing them. But you're like, wow, like I told myself really strongly that I wasn't going to do this yet. I have come up with 17 excuses allowing myself to do this. And now I'm just going to sit here. And I'm going to watch myself do the thing that I know isn't good for me with curiosity. And that can go on for years until you finally get to the point where you've watched yourself enough that you're fed up and you actually make the change. 
but that awareness is the first step. And so I think that is huge. And yes. another part of the awareness is like when you're overeating or you're eating something bad or you're craving something bad, ask yourself, what is it that you're missing emotionally? Like, mm -hmm. what are you, there's actually a whole book about it called, what are you hungry for? Mm -hmm. And that book is interesting because it also talks about how when you consume foods, when you're sad, you metabolize them differently. So you actually produce things like more inflammatory cholesterol when you're eating foods, when you're depressed versus when you're eating foods and you're happy. So this goes to like, I try to teach people how to have some grace with themselves. Like, yes, I want you to eat healthy and have a healthy diet. And if you're really sick, it's more important for you than other people. But at the same time, like if you are going to cheat, enjoy that cookie. Like, yes, absolutely. And forgive yourself. Don't eat the cookie and like beat yourself into the ground yes. and feel super guilty about it because yes. it's going to metabolize worse in your system. So it's yes. like, it's this balance. Cause I went through the thing of like not being able to eat anything and everyone's like, cut this out, cut that out. I'm like, I can literally eat like three foods and that's just not sustainable. So you have to find a way to listen to your body and be like, okay, like I'm going to eat this food that I know is like not that great for me. And now I'm going to see how my body responds and that'll tell me how long I need to to wait until I eat it again. And starting yeah. to understand that is how we create like a sustainable model of health. And then you are also, I think this actually leads into our next topic really well. So you're talking about the 14 year old with acne and stuff. And I just wanna comment on one of the really common things that happens to teenagers, especially females. So you'll often have something like acne, you'll be starting your cycle, your cycle will probably be a little bit irregular, you'll be a little bit moody because your hormones are figuring themselves out. And then one of the first things that happens is you get put on birth control to level out your hormones. And then you're a little bit depressed because your hormones are now super out of whack, you're gaining weight and the birth control also causes leaky gut, by the way, which no one really talks about and so now you're having and iron and deficiency and other mineral malabsorption and clots and it's actually 40 percent risk of depression and anxiety with birth control pills so it's not a little it's it's that's been studied and uh, we know that we know that yep. so yeah and of course fda just made it over the counter without age restriction so 12 year olds can have it now yeah, let's go into that because if you like, because this whole cycle starts where you get put on birth control and then you're depressed and then you get put on antidepressants and then like 10 years later you have an anxiety disorder and then you get put on some other medication. So let's talk about that whole cascade and the issue with over the counter stuff. Because I love to hear this Sorry, from an expert. No. I can't really comment on it as a DC. Oh, no, 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 no. You should. Christine, we need more voices to raise the alarm, especially with regard to psychiatric medications. They are, I, I, honest to God, I truly believe that they are some of the most uh, toxic molecules that were ever invented by, by man. Um, we are not taking the blame for it. <laughs> No offense to men here listening to us, but uh, but jokes apart. And why do I say that they're extremely toxic? Is because they are. I mean, it. Uh, so let's talk about as a group. Um, these medications alter the neurochemistry of our brains. And when we give them to anyone under the age of 18 or even 25, because our brains are still developing. Now let me clarify something, no single functional MRI study has looked at how the brain is developing under the influence of these drugs versus not under the influence of these drugs. We don't know that. And I go by the precautionary principle. I mean, it's not my responsibility as a consumer to prove to a company that what they're offering me is dangerous. I want the company to prove to me that what they're offering to me is safe beyond reasonable doubt. Actually, there should not be any doubt. It should be absolutely safe. Whereas these medications, like when you look at the long-term effect of all these medications, it is actually more disease, more disability, affecting not just the neuropsychiatric organs, but also your hormonal system, gastrointestinal system, immune system, and everything. Because any foreign molecule that is not natural our immune system sees that as a toxin. There is no question about that. Whether it is Tylenol, that's why, you know, World Health Organization said that Tylenol can cause inflammation in a newborn and increase risk of neuroinflammation, AKA autism. And it totally tanks your glutathione, which is definitely tied into that. Yes. 
Oh, and by the way, uh, another little piece of information that I'm, uh, I learned a few months ago is that any time there is inflammation from any other unrelated cause, so it could be LPS or it could be trauma, any inflammation in the body will tank our glutathione. So that, yep. that's also happening. But some, some molecules like Tylenol especially, they specifically reduce our antioxidant ability through the glutathione system, which is why we give NAC, IV, and IM, and through all the avenues when someone overdoses on Tylenol. That's, uh, but again, Tylenol can trigger the immune system and cause neuroinflammation and cause autism. And so in the, in the baby with immature everything, we are seeing that with such a severe illness, but as we grow older and have somewhat mature systems, we see different levels of immune activation is what I like to call it. So uh, that's one thing to remember. Any foreign non-natural chemical has the potential to aggravate or irritate our immune system. So this is what's yep. happening with the tons of molecules that we get exposed to. Now, outside of this, psychiatric medications are habit-forming. It's not only benzodiazepines and opiates, antidepressants, antipsychotics, they're all habit-forming. Your brain forms around it. Your neuro, your neuro receptors respond and change. Yes, they do. And, um, and coming off of these medications has to be a thoughtful, slow process with a lot of uh, nutraceutical support as well as mind-body medicine support. So very few people can come off of these medications without that kind of a support. And again, it goes back to your, uh, your cell's ability to tolerate stress or not, or whether, it is, whether it's resistant, it's stress resi resilient, or it is not, which again depends on your, uh, you know, uh, your nutrition, your detox state, you know, whether you're having inflammation. So again, we go back to those three things again. Um, and then psychiatric medications, antipsychotics, and antidepressants are all linked with suicide, with seizures, suicide, homicide. Many pe people don't know this, but you know. But please go back and look at those articles. There is always an, an indicator that those Sadly, those people were also taking a hold of psychiatric medications because many of these medications call, uh, cause what is called as dysphoria, which is a weird combination of irritability and sadness. And when that dysphoria increases, it can cause a very severe side effect called akathisia, which even psychiatrists do not recognize. I've had patients come in with akathisia after having gone to at least two or three different psychiatrists and they were not recognized as having akathisia. And akathisia is where people feel so anxious that they feel like jumping out of their skin. And this akathisia drives people to suicide as well as homicide. And akathisia happens when we are increasing the dosage, when we are starting a medication, when we are adding medications, when we are increasing the dosage, or when we are abruptly tapering and stopping the medication, or, you know, I hate this. I see so many times, especially in the inpatient setting, somebody's on a medication for months. They go inpatient because they're having a relapse. Why? Oh, oh, maybe they didn't take their medication. No, these medications will cause your brain to worsen over time and increase the risk of relapse of the original disease it was supposed to treat. So if you're taking an antipsychotic for schizophrenia, in the beginning it'll suppress, but over time your risk of getting more schizophrenia episodes increases. So let's say you go into the hospital because you were religiously taking your medication, but you have a relapse, and this inpatient doctor will say, oh, let's try something else. And willy-nilly, they'll stop the other medication and put something else. And this is a big problem. This is a very, very big problem. It's during these rapid medication changes we see akathisia, which I, I have a patient who is in the hospital for exactly this reason. And his psychosis was actually because of so many physical causes. He was actually thyrotoxic when he became psychotic again. Wow. And it's when you look for the root causes, you'll find them. Everything you're saying is so important right now. And I just, you know, I like I I'll just speak to my own experience actually. So 
that teenage girl that I was talking before, I was that teenage girl and oh. everything was super well intentioned, but let me tell you how it progressed, right? So I had some early life stuff that was stressful and then my mood was off and then I got put on hormones and, and then I got put on different hormones because one of them got removed from the market. And then I got put on antidepressants for years and they weren't working for me. And also the thing was, I had anxiety and they put me on an antidepressant without ever doing any kind of testing, any kind of neurological testing, any looking at what was going on with my neurotransmitters. Now that I know what I know about neurotransmitters, I was put on one that was norepinephrine and dopamine based and putting someone with really high anxiety who is in a sympathetic state on norepinephrine perpetuates the problem. So then my anxiety kept going up and up and up. I was in college at this time and I was starting to have like panic attacks. I was like, this is not me. Like I can't even control my body. What's going on? And they just kept increasing the dosage, increasing the dosage. I finally just like broke down and started searching alternative medicine. And this is how I got into this field because I was trying to do all the right things. No one asked me about like my Dr. Pepper consumption and like my bagel consumption and all of that stuff. There was no talk about that. There's no asking about like past trauma history, any of that. And um, finally, I ended up seeing a physical therapist who did neurological physical therapy. And in three appointments, my entire nervous system was reset. And I like could my vision of my field of vision was wider. I saw colors differently. I just felt completely different in my body. And I got off all medications and got into yoga and meditation and changed my study to cognitive neuroscience because I, I was like, I need to understand what you just did to my body. And then that's how I got into neurology and neuroscience. But I realized that I didn't want to go down the conventional route, even in neurology, because I was working in psych labs and a whole bunch of other stuff. I used to work a lot in research and they're really only looking at the brain. Like neurology only looks at the brain. They don't consider the brain's connection yes. to the body, which is one of the reasons I love chiropractic because it's about the entire mm -hmm. nervous system. Mm -hmm. So that is why I went that route for my foundational education. And then I've done functional medicine stuff on top of it. But what you're talking about is so common. And I had someone ask yes. earlier um, a really good question. It was like, can cardiovascular health and uh, psychiatry or and schizophrenia and all this all be tied together? 100 yeah. percent so everything that we're talking about it's all related and you know if you have cardiovascular issues then that means that you're having inflammation in your cardiovascular system mm -hmm. and that inflammation needs to be addressed and when you start to address the inflammation overall wherever it's coming from whether it is toxins whether it's gut health whether it's foods it's usually all of them but when you start to address all of them all the other symptoms start to resolve because our bodies are designed to heal and i know you're talking about using humor in your appointments and i actually think that's really important because going to the doctor these days is scary mm -hmm. and like i still you know i still try to go to my annual physical my pcp and do all the responsible things and every time i go in it's just it's rushed and it's kind of cold and mm -hmm. it's like there's nothing on the walls no one like talks to me about anything personal and so i had a client the other day and she came in and i was just like yeah you know like and she's you know been dealing with a lot of stuff i was like this is a really interesting case and she's like well i'm glad you find it interesting and i was like well i do and i'm going to talk to you like this because i think going to the doctor is scary and when you have someone that reminds you that your body is designed to heal and that it's this puzzle that we get to figure out together as a team all of a sudden it's not so scary because you're not stuck in this weird hierarchical model and you feel like yeah. you have a partner in your care and you start to feel invested in your own care because you're not just having stuff done to you you're having yeah. things done with you and for you and it's a really that in itself is healing for people yes absolutely and uh, no i i everything that you said it's, it's spot on and you know i'm really sorry that you had all of those experiences but exactly. that's me to where i am exactly yeah, I mean, I, uh, I totally I agree with that. I, you know, I, I used to blame my genetics, my parents and, you know, everything. But uh, I've come to a really deep acceptance and understanding of why I needed to go through that process. And, and it's, uh, it, yeah, we grow, we grow. And, uh, Absolutely. Well, so. I could talk to you for days, but I know you have a busy <laughs> schedule. So as we start to wrap up here, um, I know you were talking about you have some new services that you're offering clients. If people wanted to work with you or things <laughs> like that, um, what would you tell them? What things do you have coming up? Where can they find you? All that. So so thank you, Christine. Yes. So what I'm, um, so everything that I have learned over the last uh, seven years of being a holistic psychiatrist, I've actually put together in a six month program. 
and I'm calling it Psychiatry 2.0 <laughs> because this is the way mental health should be practiced. And uh, it includes consultations with me and my team. Uh, it includes the supplements that a person needs. We are including $1,500 of supplements. self-administered cleanse that we are offering as part of this program. And, um, uh, and in these six months, we take people from wherever they are, you know, with their symptoms and everything. We teach them all the components that we discussed. You know, uh, self-awareness is very big. Self-love, self-compassion, all of those concepts. We work with uh, uh, our patients to do that. And I've, uh, we've seen a pretty good success with, uh, since I launched this program in January of this year. And we're seeing a really good um, success with these, uh, in doing it in this fashion. You know, earlier it used to be like any other psychiatrist's office. You know, patients would come in for follow-up. You know, the buy-in was not there. Maybe th that's another thing. Like, you know, doing it in this protocol fashion, in this program where I am committed to an outcome and the patient is also committed to an outcome. Um, so if anyone's interested and uh, the way we have, I've structured this program. It's uh, any I can work with anyone anywhere in the world, and definitely with uh, anyone in the United States. It's going to be very easy to uh, incorporate what we are talking about. So yeah, reach out to me. You can direct message me. Uh, Trinergy Health is my handle. My office number is two six two nine five five six six zero zero. And um, really looking forward to. Um, Letting people know that, like you said, you know, it, empowerment is when we take charge of our health. There is no other, and you know, and and talking about going to doctors, I I don't. I mean, you know, I I do very very occasionally for my kids. Sometimes I have to, I don't even take them to their pediatrician uh, because that they they're not learning how to take care of themselves there, and some of them medical interventions that are being recommended for them, I don't approve of them. So that's why we only go for well check and uh, their annual physical so that they can participate in school sports. That's that's all we do. And blood work, I check their blood work. And my blood work is not covered by, their, by our insurance panel because they're only looking to cover lipid panels, but they'll not cover vitamin D and, you know, thyroid because in my history of thyroid, yeah, they're not going to cover that, which is ridiculous. So, I mean, so I do things outside of the system and, uh, uh, yeah, that's, um, so yeah, um, wonderful talking to you and yes, we should, uh, we, and uh, we connect at, at multiple levels. So, uh, absolutely. I cannot wait to talk to you again. And I know some people have commented on the, quality of the connection. Uh, sorry, guys, technology is just technology sometimes. But that just gives me an excuse to invite her back so that we can do a 2.0 version of this talk. So thank you so much, Dr. Tamala, for your time and your wisdom and your knowledge. Like, I think this is a really important talk for people. So I'll definitely invite you back so that we can do this again. And um, for anyone who is looking for any help, reach out to either of us. And we have a variety of resources. And that's what we do these for. We just want you guys to be happy and healthy and understand your bodies more because both of us think that education is one of the things missing the most yes. in healthcare. So um, thank you again, and thank I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. thank you, and my apologies. I don't know if could, the issue can be on our side too, on oh, my side too. It's just Instagram. Maybe we'll do a Zoom next time, and I'll pre-record it, and then I can upload it, and it'll be top-notch quality for you guys. But I like having you guys ask questions, so it's like the balance yes. between the two. Yeah. Well, okay. have a wonderful day and much love. Thank you. Bye-bye.